Hi, welcome to Voices Against Sexual Assault. Today I have John Crow with me. He's the licensed mental health counselor and certified trauma therapist. He has an office right on Delaware Avenue. Hi, John. How are Hi. you? I'm well, thanks. How are you, Jenny? Well, you wear a couple different hats. Um, one of them is you have your own private counseling um, business, right? Yes. And the other, you work for Ulster County for the mental health department. Yes, for the Mental Health Association in Ulster County, I work with them on a project called Building Connections, which is the Sexual Assault Mental Health Project. Okay, and uh, tell me a little bit about your private counseling. Well, I work with trauma survivors of all kinds. Um, I've worked with veterans. I work with men that are sexual abuse and incest survivors. I also do a lot of work in the addictions field. And um, there's a lot of overlap between trauma and addiction as there is between trauma and mental health issues. So trauma oftentimes is at the heart of a lot of diagnoses. Um, today I was interested in hearing more about covert incest. That's something that you've been working with in your practice and also seen through your work um, through Ulster, the Building Connections also, right? Yes, it's very interesting because, um, <clears throat> excuse me, um, covert incest is basically a person who's been covertly incested comes from a family where there have been poor emotional or physical boundaries and the impact of that can be somewhere in the same arena as literal physical incest mm. because it's still an invasion of a child by a parent and it has emotional implications that can be pretty far-reaching. So covert incest is separate from incest. It's two different things in that with covert incest there's no actual sexual assault, correct? There is no literal physical contact, but it gets it gets a little gray. And so I mean covert incest I think is more of a continuum mm. than sexual assault. So I've worked with people, for example, whose experience has been, you know, um, my mother, for example, um, used to ask me to help her to unhook her brassiere, which again I always like to say my understanding is is that you can do that yourself. Or someone who had a parent who walked around the house scantily clad or where there was um, a kind of a gratuitous nudity. And then you go further and further down the continuum. I've also worked with people where um, the parentified child, and I'll say more about that in a minute, mm -hmm. became the confidant of the adult and would sort of become an involuntary marriage counselor mm -hmm. up to and including hearing stories about the parents intimate life which is very invasive for a child to experience. If we go back to sort of the beginning of covert incest in terms of how it develops within the family or within the family structure um, can it happen in single parent homes? Can it happen in dual parent homes? And what about extended home households in terms of, you know, if they're grandparents and parents within the house? Well, the interesting thing that I see with covert incest is it's very much intergenerational. So if I'm working oh. with someone who's an adult and um, they're struggling with issues around boundaries themselves, there's a pretty good chance that their parent invaded their emotional space oh. and their role in the family and that the same thing happened to the parent. So it's not uncommon, for example, for a parent who was uh, made the caregiver of their parent passes that expectation on oh. to their child. So they then expect the child to be their, the parent's primary emotional caregiver. So it runs usually through several generations. Oh, it does. Oh. And I don't think it's any more prone to happen, people may think that, in single parent families. Mm -hmm. What the real um, bottom line is, are there good emotional boundaries, physical mm -hmm. boundaries, and sexual boundaries in the family? If there are good boundaries in the family, whether it's single parent or two parent families, then that child will be healthy. If the boundaries are poor, then that child is going to grow up as an adult with issues. So say it's a, a two parent household, husband and wife, and one of the parents is sort of less involved with the family. They're not participating in activities or the bill paying or whatever. And they're sort of, I think the term shadow parent. Mm -hmm. um, so they're sort of the parent that's not really involved. Their physical presence is there. Um, and then the invasive parent is 
a little more in charge of everything and more on top of everything, but they're looking for emotional connection. Is that correct? And they're not Very really getting so. it from their spouse. So they're turning to the child for advice, comfort, um, just for really their emotional support. Well, absolutely. And what's going on with the non-engaged parent can simply be an emotional detachment or it can be an addiction. Oh. So what happens is it could be different circumstances okay. that make that parent uninvolved or detached. You mean they could be an addicted parent, addicted to substance abuse? Absolutely. Oh, and that's why they're not engaged. Absolutely. So it might not necessarily just be their lack of interest or they have, you know, just no affect or whatever. It could be their addictions taking them elsewhere. It could be that. It could be one of those sort of emotionally cold, remote families mm -hmm. but what I tend to see is a lot of it in addicted families. Oh, so the addicted parent is otherwise preoccupied with their addiction. Absolutely. So leaving the remaining parent uh, with no emotional support and turning to the child. And the parent then turns to the child who mm -hmm. becomes either the father or mother's primary caregiver. Mm, okay. The non-addicted spouse basically invades the subsystem of the child and brings them up to the level of parent mm. to be a peer with the non-addicted parent. Mm -hmm. Someone to turn to, someone to talk about what's going on. Okay. And now in a single parent household, um, would that single parent necessarily be an addicted person? Or would that person be a non-addicted person turning to the child? Would they have come from a relationship with an addicted person? Possibly. I think the most important thing in a single parent family is to make sure that the single parent has a peer support system. Mm. So then that p single parent is not going to rely on children mm -hmm. to meet the emotional needs of an adult. Mm -hmm. In a family where there's two parents and one of them is addicted, the issue that really needs to be dealt with is the addiction and the mm. impact that the addiction is having on the family. But when someone decides to stay with someone who's actively addicted, they're more prone to get their needs met by sort of picking a child as their emotional caregiver. Mm. And I'm sure all this done like subconsciously, the invasive parent, does, do they even realize what they're doing when they're drawing in this child? I don't think so. Um, it's fascinating how much of this is subconscious, but as a family systems therapist, mm -hmm systems always seek balance. So mm -hmm. if one, um, one of the parents or one of the partners abdicates, then that space is left open. And so in a sense, the system mm -hmm. seeks equilibrium. And so the parent pulls a child up to try and take the place of the absent mm -hmm. parent. Mm -hmm. Now, um, what signs can someone see in a child to help see that there's something wrong, you know, so that we could reach out to this child and uh, guide them toward help. And I mean, you want to say a teacher or a nurse, but I mean, it could be anyone in a community. What, how could we identify there's a problem? Well, it's really interesting because most children that experience covert incest mm -hmm. don't see it as a problem. Because mm. um, it's I, natural to them, right? Well, that's what they know. Mm -hmm. And so I have a couple of things that I listen for, which is when someone says to me, my mother was my best friend, mm. that sort of gives me pause because okay. I want to know what that means mm. because it's good to have your mother also be a friend. Mm -hmm. But when someone says they're the best friend, that sort of gives me pause. And also, I'll sometimes ask people when I'm first seeing them, mm. you know, did you ever feel like a relationship with either parent might have been too close. Mm. And sometimes we can then begin to explore it. But the tricky thing is that someone who's been covertly incested, mm -hmm. as opposed to someone who's been overtly incested, where there's been literal physical touch, the person who's been covertly incested feels privileged. Oh, really? Because oh. that person as a child mm -hmm. has heard things like, you know, if it wasn't for you, I don't know what I'd do. Oh. Um, but then they also hear troubling messages like, um, I don't know why your father can't be more like you. Mm -hmm. You know, you're so understanding mm -hmm. and you're so compassionate. 
And so that child is taught to believe that he or she has the power to control the emotions of an adult. Oh, okay. So that's why this is really an issue. And when someone comes to see me, what usually will bring them in the door if they have a history of covert incest is relationship issues. Mm. You know, so it's, it's usually their partner mm -hmm. or spouse who will say, this person just won't get close to me. Mm -hmm. They won't let me in. They have intimacy issues. Mm -hmm. and, and usually part of the reason that happens is someone who's been covertly incested has a very visceral fear of being trapped. Mm -hmm. Because as a child, mm -hmm. they were trapped. Even though mm -hmm. consciously they may have felt proud and mm -hmm. they may have felt privileged and, oh, mom tells me I'm so special and mm -hmm. that makes me feel really good. But what will show up as an adult is these are the people who go from one relationship to another mm -hmm. because the intimacy gets to a certain level and they panic. Mm. And they run, they bolt out of the relationship or create chaos in the relationship. Or bounce from one relationship to another, serial okay. relationships. Now, one big thing um, that I just want to point out is covert incest does not necessarily stop at puberty or at the end of any childhood. Indeed. That this can go on for the child's entire life. I mean, after adulthood, after they're a parent, whatever, if that relationship hasn't been separated with the parent, right, or dealt with in some That's way. an excellent point because what that means, I mean, those are the people I work with that are in their 30s mm -hmm. or 40s and still live at home. Okay. You know, and one of the normal developmental stages in life mm -hmm. is leaving home and establishing your own identity and your own home and your own support system. Mm -hmm. And yet, in a family where there's been covert incest, mm -hmm. there will rarely be permission for that person to leave. Oh, okay. So either they never leave or they leave and then come back. Mm -hmm. And it's oftentimes interesting to me to see in covertly incestuous families how one of the children is usually the designated caregiver. Mm -hmm. And that person is usually the one who's sort of expected to make the sacrifice of being the parental caregiver, mm -hmm. usually for the rest of their lives. Mm. That's what I was kind of wondering, if the family structure is such that, say there's three children or ten children, is it usually just one child that's covertly incested, or could it be all the children? Well, it's usually what happens is, in a family that large, mm -hmm. especially if there's an addictive process going on, um, it's not uncommon to sort of see some kids align with mom, some kids align oh. with dad, and then some kids sort of try and stay in the middle and lay low. Oh, okay. And um, the other thing about leaving home, which is interesting, mm -hmm. is even if the person physically leaves home, mm -hmm. it's not uncommon to have an adult child, for example, say, well, I have to call my mother every day. Oh, yeah, or I have to right. call my father every day. Yeah, and oftentimes right. I'll hear the spouse say he or she seems to be closer to their parent than to me. Oh, okay. So there's a couple of ways that that can show up. And again, it, it's sort of a delicate process of getting the, the individual to explore mm -hmm. what the true nature of the relationship was with the invasive parent. And that means sacrificing the image of what they thought was true. Mm -hmm. Well, that's one thing I was kind of wondering is how do you identify what's crossing the line in covert incest in terms of, say, it's an adult relationship and the adult child's calling the parent every day, but the parent's elderly, they're infirmed, and the child who's an adult, say, you know, 30 years old, 50 years old, whatever, um, is calling to check on them as worried about them and worried about their care. Sure. Um, would it be, would you be looking at, well, was there a history of this? Or I mean, how could you Not identify necessarily. that there's I a mean, problem? That's an, another really important point, which is that as our parents age, mm -hmm. you know, a lot of us are finding ourselves in the, in the role of being caregivers mm -hmm. for them. Mm -hmm. I think that's really a very different situation. Okay. But what I do try and encourage people to do is can this be a family responsibility? Mm. Because even just from the point of view of if there was no covert incest in the family whatsoever, my hope would still be that the family 
would take on caring for aging parents as a family issue mm -hmm. and not sort of uh, pass it on to one individual mm -hmm. child or sibling. Now, what about culturally, too? Because within certain cultures, it's common for the children to remain at home, to live at home uh, until they're married, or to live in the apartment in the home or next door. So how do you identify, like, it's a problem relationship or it's a healthy relationship? Well, I've had this discussion with some colleagues because um, I was working with someone once who um, came from a cultural norm of the family bed. Oh. And so where when this person was a child, mm -hmm. you know, both parents and the two children slept in the same mm -hmm. bed. If there's a cultural I norm. I hear that a lot, actually. So, yeah, right. Uh -huh. If it's a cultural norm, I think that's one thing. Mm -hmm. But people have to remember that in this larger culture, okay. that is not the norm. Mm -hmm. And so I think that eventually that child is going to run into a situation either with peers at school mm -hmm. or at some point where he or she is going to realize there's there's a dissonance here mm -hmm. that what I'm experiencing or did experience is not the norm in the larger society so it gets a little gray I'm, I'm a firm believer in respecting cultural traditions but you know in this culture there's going to be implications for the children mm -hmm. and I think it's a question of what are the traditions that we really cherish and want to hold on to and maybe the idea of a family bed is a little too complicated especially in this day and age mm -hmm. when that could raise all kinds of questions well i've heard of situations where for economic reasons um, a particular family that immigrated to this country in i think it was the early eighties you know i'm just thinking of a specific scenario that i had run into uh... they had one bedroom and I think there were 10 members of the family total. Mm. So, so many of them were in the bed and other ones on bedding on the floor, but they were not all individually bedded down. Right. You know, however many could fit in that double bed is who slept in that double bed. And then the, everyone else just slept all around on the floor. And indeed, you know, economic circumstances dictate the choices that people make, certainly. Um, and I'm not going to say that a family emigrating to this mm -hmm. country is any more at risk than any other group. Um, but I think it's, it's one of those situations where it really comes down to, I think the common denominator mm -hmm. is, what are the emotional boundaries mm -hmm. in the house? That's what I was thinking. It's more really about what are the symptoms, what are the problems, what's kind of going on in terms of um, is that person having healthy relationships and is it healthy boundaries within everyone in the family and i've worked with a lot of people that you know w grew up poor yeah and had scenarios where i had to share a bed mm -hmm. with my brother mm -hmm. or two brothers and so forth and and the key is if there's if it's an emotionally healthy family mm -hmm. with good boundaries then that's just something that that family had to do to survive mm, that's a good point yeah, because uh, they still have boundaries on what's acceptable. And they're not, I think one of the key things from my understanding of covert incest is, is a child carrying an unnecessary burden or unrealistic burden, a burden that's not healthy, that's not uh, good for the child, it's not good for the parent, you know, is that what's going on? Or are they just, you know, helping each other out and, you know, whatever for economic reasons? I think um, when a parent starts turning to the child and, you know, being the buddy and wanting to confine them, that it's just, just such a heavy burden for the child to carry because they're trying to meet those needs of the adult, which is, like, impossible. And even when the child becomes an adult, I mean, if they're 60 and their parent's 85 and it's still going on, you know, nothing ever changed it, I can see where it would totally handicap that individual. Well, when it's usually... I usually see this in my adult clients mm -hmm. and again what I'll see is a fear of being trapped in a relationship, okay. a fear of being controlled in a relationship. Mm -hmm. This person is usually a distancer and so nobody gets particularly close. Mm -hmm. And then again as I was saying earlier I'm, I have to sort of look at what's showing up in the here and now mm -hmm. to find out what happened in the there and then. Do you find that um, the adult children that you meet with 
have become addicted to substance abuse themselves or substances themselves. Well, that's a good point because some do, but one of the things, um, the book that I like to recommend to people is called Silently Seduced, mm -hmm. and it's by Kenneth Adams. And I would say in about the 15 years I've been in private mm -hmm. practice, I've probably had 70% um, of my clients read that book. And I think it really applies because there's a lot of addiction in this society. Mm -hmm. And when you're dealing with addiction, you're going to deal with poor boundaries. There's no such mm. thing as an addicted family system that has healthy boundaries. Mm. Uh, when I was searching the website under Covert Incest, I saw that book came up a number of times. And, uh, you know, just from the preliminary sketch of it, I, I was like, oh, this looks like it's a pretty good book. So It's a great book. Uh, resource and you know the other kind of scenario I want to just mention in mm -hmm. passing is that um, it can happen father usually in, in Kenneth Adams book he looks at it from the point of view of mothers and sons and fathers and daughters mm. and he's he's a little s rigid about that okay. because I've worked with adult women for example mm -hmm. who came from a family where a mom was struggling with mental illness mm. And so that daughter got pulled into a parentified mm -hmm. role because, again, she was drawn in to try and keep the family stable. Mm -hmm. Sometimes the father was an equal partner and tried to address things. Sometimes the father was exhausted and handed that responsibility over to the daughter and became more peripheral. Mm -hmm. So it can be uh, mother-daughter, mother-son, father-daughter, father-son. Okay, so it can go from same-sex parents. Absolutely. So it could be mother, daughter, or father, son. And what about the difference in, um, what was I going to say, can it happen between siblings, where the siblings become the parents completely to give the emotional support to the parent? I mean, almost like say there's a male and female child, and they sort of become the two parents in the household, but it's to support the, um, what would you call it, the shadow parent? Well, you know, the, the, the unfortunate... Or actually be the invasive parent. Well, the unfortunate thing okay. about that is um, the sibling who's the caregiver mm -hmm. of the other siblings okay. usually ends up being resented by them. Okay. Because that individual is in a no-win situation. Mm. They can't, if we go with the stereotypical situation right. of dad's the alcoholic and mom's okay. the codependent, and so dad's more and more absent, he can't risk, and this is a son, let's say, mm -hmm. he can't risk alienating what little affection there is from mom, mm -hmm. but he wants to try and connect with dad, but then dad tends to be rejecting both because of his addiction mm -hmm. and also because dad feels increasingly shut out because of the overclose bond between son and mother. Mm -hmm. So when oh. that young oh. man, let's say, usually the oldest, but not always, when he becomes the surrogate parent of his siblings, yes. they will oftentimes grow up to resent him, unfortunately. Oh. So sometimes that works where the addicted parent, as we're using this example, the father resents that the mother's turning to the child for emotional support. Absolutely. Oh. Hmm. Wow. Well, now, what can people do, John? I know, can they email you? Is there web, are there websites they can go to? I mean, what can someone do for help? If people want to either see me or to get a referral, my phone number is 424-2724 in the 518 area code. They could absolutely read Kenneth Adams' book, Silently Seduced, and just see what fits. I think the most important thing about um, covert incest mm -hmm. is, uh, to go back to your earlier question, is it's oftentimes related to sexual addiction in adults. Oh, in what way? Well, in some of those relationships, going back to a parent who walks around scantily clad, okay. um, or that, that there's a kind of a sexual charge in some of these intrusive, invasive relationships, even mm -hmm. if there's no physical touch. And so the child picks up on that sexual energy, hmm. and it's a very strong energy, and doesn't have the consciousness or the wherewithal developmentally mm -hmm. to do anything with it. And so mm -hmm. there's that titillation, that stimulation, there's the secrecy around it, there's the, the mixed messages around it, and a lot of people that have been covertly incested mm -hmm. 
actually literally become sex addicts themselves. Mm. And the pattern will just keep repeating um, parent to child, parent to child, unless that cycle is broken. It can. There's always a, there's a subtext of inappropriate boundary crossing and sexual energy in a lot of uh, covertly incestuous relationships. Mm. The child picks up on that and it's, I, I look at it like a lot of addictions. It's a sexual addiction, meaning that that person now as an adult is trying to solve this problem that's been handed to them mm -hmm. of broken boundaries, more affect than they were ready to handle, things that were required of them that, weren't, um, that they weren't able to meet developmentally, and then also to numb all that out. Mm. Is there hope? Absolutely, absolutely. If someone's sexually addicted, there's a program called Sex and Love Addicts Anonymous, which is a wonderful 12-step mm -hmm. program that has several meetings in the Capital District. And again, people can read Kenneth Adams' book. Not everyone who's covertly incested will become sexually addicted. Mm -hmm. They may have some other kind of compulsivity or, or addiction, and they may have none. Mm -hmm. They may be compulsive caregivers. Mm -hmm. If you're the one who's mm -hmm. always taking care of other people, but you seem to never have any needs, mm -hmm. one possible source of that could be covert incest. Now, since uh, lack of boundaries is really a common thing in homes that there's been substance abuse, and it's also common in a covert incest home, um, and sometimes it, that both things are happening in the same home, how do you as a counselor start to break that down and start to kind of get through all of that? You know, do you work with the addiction first? Do you work with the co effects of the covert incest first? I mean, how do you even start to kind of get through all that? Well, that's uh, an important aspect of this is where do you begin? Mm. If a person comes to me and they're actively seeking help, mm -hmm. as much as possible, I try and work collaboratively with uh, a client because the last thing they need mm -hmm. is an authority figure trying mm -hmm. to get them to do what he or she wants them to do because that's the exact situation they were raised right. in. Mm. So it's a real power sharing, flattening out the hierarchy as much mm -hmm. as possible, mm -hmm. collaborative relationship. So if, for example, if someone's sexual addiction, and all addictions, of course, are progressive, left untreated, they always get worse. Okay. If someone's sexual addiction has accelerated to the point where they're engaging in any kind of life-threatening behavior, mm -hmm. like unprotected sex, that's a place where I would intervene immediately. Um, but the bottom line is someone's only going to stop even life-threatening behavior when they're ready to stop. Mm -hmm. So I try and build a collaborative sort of power-sharing relationship, and then I use a harm reduction approach in terms of, because most people usually know when they're putting themselves in danger, mm -hmm. But if it's like, if I talk it through with them mm -hmm. and have sort of like a joint agreement, mm -hmm. how can we change your behavior? Mm -hmm. What problem is your behavior trying to solve? Mm -hmm. If you were to let go of this behavior, what skills might you need to replace mm -hmm. it? Mm -hmm. That's a much more collaborative, user-friendly, let's say, approach mm -hmm. in therapy than you have to stop, you have to stop right now, mm -hmm. go to five meetings a week, et cetera. Mm -hmm that kind of harm reduction approach is usually a lot more successful with addictions, even the most life-threatening ones. And just substituting um, like bad coping skills with positive coping skills can be a good thing, right? I had, uh, I think of people I've worked with where if they were acting out sexually, mm -hmm. anonymously, you know, my primary goal was to get them to use a condom, mm. you know, and, and then later on I would work with them on backing off from some of the behaviors. Mm -hmm. So it was really a first things first kind of mm. a thing. A lot of the old models of addiction treatment were a little too severe mm -hmm. because the expectation was a person could stop everything at once. And now thankfully we know that things like harm reduction exist because like most of us we heal in stages. Mm -hmm. It's like peeling away the skin on an onion is how I think about it. You know, you've got all this stuff in there. and You just need to go through the layers and, you know, allow the uh, client who's come to see you to kind of lead that and direct that um, way, um, especially what you're saying in this situation.